Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserport.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeon, and we're going to be looking back on another disappointing performance, another disappointing result. Arsenal won Brighton and Hove Albion 2 at the Emirates Stadium. Freddie's first game in charge didn't quite go as planned. Uh, lots of angry supporters uh, after the game and people just recognising the fact that Arsenal probably do need to go out there and get a top, top manager in ASAP. So many issues at the club, um, not just on the field, but off it too. Uh, There's a huge disconnect between the fans and the ownership, and it feels as though they're not taking the right steps to get Arsenal back to where they belong. Um, Let's start off by talking about the pre-game feeling. Of course, going into the game, people were pretty positive. I was one of them. I said I was buzzing to go to the Emirates for the first time in a while, and Maybe the enthusiasm of having somebody like Freddie uh, in charge took over and maybe that clouded my judgment a little bit. But I thought Arsenal were going to go there and win um, on Thursday night. And it was really, really disappointing to not only not win the game, but to lose it. To lose at home against a side who you know, could well be uh, dragged into the relegation scrap at some point is really, really disappointing. And, and the fact is that Brighton deserved it. Nobody can deny that. Um, you know, the mood before the game, like I said, I thought it was pretty good. There was a I love you, baby, can't take my eyes off you, was playing around the stadium, um, you know, before the players come out because Freddie Lundberg was there. And there was this this excitement and this buzz. And we saw some positives at Norwich, didn't we? We saw a more attacking approach. We saw Arsenal dominate the first half and pushing further up the field, up to the halfway line almost. And you hoped that we'd continue that and, and obviously improve on it. But that wasn't to be the case. Um, it was a really, really, really poor start, and Freddie Lundberg uh, has said that as well in his in his post match interview. Let's start with the team selection. He went with Bernd Leno in goal. Socrates came back into the centre of the defence in place of uh, Shkodran Mustafi. Still no place for Kieran Tierney. Sergei Kalasinac got the nod at left back again, and Hector Bellerin returned uh, to replace Callum Chambers, and then. In the middle of the park, uh, Genduzi was left out in favour of Lucas Torreira, and I had, you know, called for that to be done from a while ago. I felt that the the best midfield balance we could possibly find with the players that we had available was that of Xhaka and Torreira. And to be fair to Granite Xhaka, well, I'm going to come on to player ratings in a little bit, but I thought he was one of Arsenal's better players again for the second game running. So. Um, I don't really have any issues with that. Torreira was a little bit disappointing, but like I said, we'll come on to player ratings a little bit later on. And then we had Mesut Ozil out on the left, um, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang out on the right, and Alex Lacazette through the middle. And Arsenal really need to find an alternative way of accommodating Lacazette and Aubameyang because I understand that they're both two very, very important players. I understand that the manager wants to get them both in the side, but Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang is such a lethal goal scorer it feels like such a waste having him out on the right-hand side. Let me know what you guys think, but I don't think that is something that continue, it can continue. Sorry, It's not sustainable. And you can see that Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang at times looks a little bit disinterested, and I think that's probably got something to do with it. I'm sure that Aubameyang won't want to play out on the flank, and I don't care how good a mate he is with Alex Lacazette. At some point, that is going to grind on the Arsenal captain, and it's not fair. It's not fair. Um... And it's not only not fair on the player, but it feels like we're handicapping ourselves in the process. One of the things that I was impressed by at Norwich, and I've already touched on it, was the fact that Arsenal pushed right up to the halfway line and squeezed their opponent into their own half and put them under relentless pressure throughout that first half. But for some reason, and I don't know if it's because Socrates was back in the defence, but Arsenal just sunk deeper and deeper and deeper and ended up playing on the edge of our own penalty area trying to play our way out of possession uh, sorry out of the defense using possession and it was a, a, a tr- it was like watching Unai Emery's team again it was watching us put ourselves under unnecessary pressure it was watching us get you know pressed right on the edge of our penalty area and seeing errors forced out of our defenders and it was just something I hoped we'd kind of dropped uh, based on that game up at Norwich but obviously that wasn't to be let's look at some of the goals um Arsenal 
you know, deserve to go behind. There's no doubt about that. Brighton were by far the better side in the opening exchanges. They looked more comfortable. They looked more confident. They were first to every ball. They were far more up for it than we were. And as Freddie said, we just didn't turn up in the first half. We really, really didn't. And if you look at the goal again, the cross comes in. And Arsenal have two opportunities to defend this. The first one is, uh, I think it's Burn at the back post. He gets up. Um, he wins the header. It falls to um, to to their uh, their young forward. I forget the name. Oh, I forgot the name. Anyway, uh, but it falls to him. And then it ends up being turned in by Webster. And it's a really, 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 really poor piece of defending. And like I said, Arsenal had multiple opportunities to get rid of the ball. Connolly, that's the forward's name, Connolly. Um, it, he could have scored. Byrne could have scored. Eventually, Webster did. It was just such poor, poor defending. Arsenal completely switched off. And when Brighton took the lead, I don't think there was anybody in the ground or watching it at home on TV or even listening to it on the radio that would have said they weren't good value for that lead. They certainly deserved to go in front. They made their opportunity count. Um, and it was a deserved lead. Arsenal went in at half-time, a goal down. Um... And then, you know, that 10, 15 minutes spell at the start of the second half was probably Arsenal's best period of the entire game. Uh, there was energy, there was uh, there was desire, there was passion. You know, we looked like we were really up for it. We looked as though Freddie had given them all a kick up the arse at half time, and everybody had come out with a fire in their belly, with a desire to go on and turn this game around. And Alex Lacazette typified that in his work rate, in his ability um, to put defenders under pressure. He was putting himself about. He was making slide tackles. And he got the reward. He got the goal. He got across the near post and he flicked a header, uh, a looping header towards the back post. It crept in. Um, there was a VAR check. There is a VAR check on every goal. And uh, there was a lot of people around me in the stadium who were going, why are VAR checking that? VAR check every single goal. And I guess on that one, they were looking for whether Ser Kalasinac had got a touch on it, whether he was on side, whether he'd fouled the defender. Um, there was a couple of bits and pieces that they were probably looking at there. But like I said, VAR will check every single goal. Shouldn't always take as long as that, I agree, but they will be looking at every single goal. So that should come as no surprise to people. Um, but other than that 10, 15 minute period, I don't think Arsenal or indeed Alexander Lacazette did anything else worth noting. You know, it was such a... Yeah, the stadium got up on their feet. Everybody was up for it. The the atmosphere was was great for that short period of time, but then it all went flat again. And that was as a result of Arsenal not being able to create anything of note. And Freddie Lundberg made a couple of changes. He threw Nicolas Pepe on. He threw Martinelli on. And he kind of done what Arsene Wenger used to do, where you just throw on as many forwards as you possibly can, hoping you get the best out of them. But it didn't work. And as a result, Arsenal were very, very weak again in the middle of the park, were you know, so focused on getting forward and winning the game that we almost forgot to defend again. Uh, and that's been a real, real problem with this Arsenal side. It's the basics of defending. And Brighton regained their lead. And again, deservedly so. Brighton were the better side throughout the game, bar a 10-minute period. And, you know, we can talk about how, uh, you know, forceful Arsenal were on the, on the attack in that opening 10, 15 minutes of the second half. But ultimately, it doesn't matter what you do defensively if you don't defend properly. And just looking at Brighton's uh, winner in the end, you know, Hector Bayer just allows, I think it was Moy, to get the cross in so easily. He's unchallenged. You've got to do more to try and stop the cross. Hector Bayer, by the way, doesn't look fit whatsoever. Um, but he, he's got to do more there. And then David Lewis has got to be tighter to Mope, the striker, because... He's got an easy header there. He's, the, the power's already on the cross. He's completely unchallenged. David Lewis is standing off him. And Mope just guides the header into the bottom corner. And Brighton restore their lead. And as I said, they deserved it. You can't deny that. Let's go through uh, my player ratings. Uh, Burned Leno in goal. I thought he made a couple of decent saves again in the first half. Um, so I'm going to give him a, a, a six, six and a half. Six and a half, I think, Burn Leno. Uh, Hector Bayerin, I'm going to give him a four. I thought he was dreadful. Um, I thought that he looked so far off the pace once again. In terms of his sharpness getting forward, he seems to have lost that yard or two of pace. But defensively is where the real concern is. He gave the ball away a couple of times in the first half, put us under real pressure 
due to his uh, insistence and, and willingness and I guess want to to play the ball quickly first time when Arsenal were trying to play the ball out from the back. He wasn't getting back quick enough. And for me, I'm going to give Bayer in a four. Really, really poor performance, I thought. And he's got a long way to go before getting back to his best. Socrates, I'm going to give him a four as well. Um, just all over the shop, just so chaotic in his manner. And that filters through to the rest of the centre-halves and the rest of the defensive unit, I feel. Um there was an incident where he got booked for a foul right on the corner flag on a Brighton player. Debates whether it was a foul or not, but he just spent so much time arguing and it felt like that had taken away from his concentration. And, and that's a problem with Socrates. He gets so involved in that side of the game that often he switches off and, and has brain farts defensively and it's not good enough. Um, four for him. David Lewis, four as well. David Lewis was poor again. Um got forward had a goal ruled out by VAR rightly so it was a mile offside and I'll be honest I was standing with a mate and, and we didn't even celebrate because we we realized that there was a great chance he was offside given how much space uh, he'd found himself in uh, to volley that into the goal so yeah I thought his defensive performance was as bad as it's been in an Arsenal shirt and for that reason I can't give him anything more than a four um left back Ser Kalasinac I'm going to give Kalasinac a five because I didn't think he was that bad defensively. I thought that he was one of the better players against Norwich as well. But with Kalasinac, I think there were times where he just showed his drive and we really, really missed that. We didn't have that on the other side in Bellerin. It was all a little bit half-hearted. Granted, it's probably down to fitness, but what Kalasinac did a few times was get his head down and just drive forward and, and try and make an impact and try and force the issue. Yes, his end product isn't great. Yes, he's not the best defender, but... For me, he'll get a slightly higher mark at five because he showed uh, a desire, at least, to push forward and try and get Arsenal back into the game. In the midfield, uh, Granit Xhaka. I'm going to give Granit Xhaka a seven because I thought Granit Xhaka was, particularly in the first half, Arsenal's best player on the pitch. I thought he'd done the simple things right. I think since he's come back, he's got his head down. He's gotten on with it. We've seen him make a, a few really important interceptions in these past couple of games where he gets back and supports his centre-halves, something that he's not done enough in the past. Um, so I think there's been a real improvement from Granit Xhaka. So I'm going to give him a seven. Lucas Torreira for me... Um, I'm going to give him a five. I thought there were moments where he put himself about and he showed the tenacity that we've come to associate with Lucas Torreira. But in terms of his positioning, I thought it was all over the shop. I didn't think he sat and protected as much as he should have. And I thought when he did get into sort of those further forward positions, he didn't make use of the ball very well. Um, so I'm going to give Lucas Torreira a five. Um, looking further ahead, uh, Joe Willock. Joe Willock was poor. Joe Willock was so, so poor, and he has been for a while now. You know, he's got that energy, he's got the fitness, gets up and down, gets into good positions, but his, his ability on the ball and his awareness of what is around him is just not at the level it needs to be. And there was an incident in the first half where Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang um, had a real go at him because he misplaced the pass. Uh, and, you know, that was uh, the first sign of real, real frustration last night, I would say, displayed by, by our captain, Aubameyang. So, yeah, I thought um, Joe Willock was, was poor. I'm going to give him a four as well. And he was hooked, wasn't he, for Nicola Pepe? And uh, rightly so, completely understandable. Messi Ozil on the left, I'm going to give him a four as well. I thought he was poor last night. I've defended him time and time again. I always talk about his creativity. We certainly didn't see any signs of that. But the only caveat to that is that he was playing out on the left wing. And, and that's not his position, is it? And you're asking him to do defensive work by playing there, which he's not going to do. And he's simply not good enough at. He's a little bit isolated. I would have liked to have seen him in probably Joe Willock's position and maybe a winger start instead. Um, so I thought Freddie got that wrong. I thought he got that wrong at Norwich as well. Um, of course, hindsight is a wonderful thing. But ultimately, you've got to make these calls. And you've got to make them to the best of your ability. And I feel like... The inclusion of Joe Willock in that position over Ozil is Jumberg picking his favourites, the players that he's brought through the youth ranks. And I don't necessarily think that that's the right approach to take as a manager. Um, Alex Lacazette, bar a, a 10 minute spell, I'd give him a five. I thought he was pretty poor as well. Has been poor for a while. Don't think he warrants his place in the starting 11 at the minute. Um, and you do wonder what Gabriel Martinelli's got to do to get a start because. 
again when he came on uh, he showed uh, an energy uh, a fight uh, you know uh, an awareness of of the right positions to take up and he had a header uh, that was saved brilliantly by Ryan um, pushed around the post and and you know he couldn't really do much more with it because there wasn't that cross on the, uh, sorry, there wasn't that power I should say on the cross, but he done really well to to get it on target and divert it as best as he could, and it was another flash of what Martinelli can do, and I, I think for me he's got to be getting more game time at the minute. Uh, Pierre Emerick Aubameyang on the right, I'm going to give him a five as well. Um, moments of of where he caused Brighton danger, but again, not enough. But again, I'll put a caveat on that. He shouldn't be playing on the right wing. He shouldn't be playing on any wing, full stop. Um, so I think Freddie's got some real decisions to make. Freddie's got to think long and hard about some of the, the selections that he's making. And often people say, uh, and they said after the Norwich game, you know, he's only had one training session in Lundberg. How can he, um, how can he make the right calls here? But ultimately, I think people are forgetting that he has been the assistant manager. He should still know the squad. He should still know the the strengths and weaknesses of these individuals. He should still have an idea of who's suited to doing what. And for that reason, I cannot give him a complete free pass when it comes to picking the team and it comes to trying to suss out who's best where. So Freddie Lundberg has, has quite a bit to answer for as well. Look... I'm not going to sit here and blame Lundberg for last night. I'm not going to sit here and blame him for not winning at Norwich. I'm not going to sit here and say that he's a terrible manager and this and that and and get on his back. He's an Arsenal legend. Everybody's going to support him. However, I think what last night showed is that there is a real, real need to go out and get a top quality, experienced manager who will come in and shake things up, change things, change the direction, get into players, someone with authority, someone with the power to walk into that changing room and make the players fear him, give him a kick up the arse. And for me, you've got to go down the Ancelotti route. You've got to go down the Allegri route. You've got to do whatever it takes to get one of these top, top football managers in an Arsenal football club because we are in free fall. And the longer you leave this, the, the more dangerous it becomes. People are talking about relegation. I don't think Arsenal are going to get relegated. Let, let's, let's have it right. But we're a long way off of where we need to be. Uh, and this season is in danger of fizzling out and being a complete waste. People will say in terms of the league, it, it's gone already. Maybe the top four has gone already, but we're still in the Europa League. We're still in the FA Cup. So there is something to salvage, but I just think Arsenal need to make the move now, sooner rather than later. Because despite the, the change of manager, the uplift hasn't been there. That new manager bounce that you saw at Manchester United when Ali Gunnar Solskjaer immediately took over, that's not happened at Arsenal. The, it, things are too far gone. The damage has already been done. I think people are, are going to realise now just how much damage Unai Emery done. But ultimately, the board have a part to play in this as well. They've not made the right appointments. They've not brought in the right players. And it just feels like from top to bottom, it's an absolute shit show at the Emirates. Real, real problems, real, real concerns. West Ham away on Monday night. It's not going to be an easy game. Uh, They haven't been great this season, but it's never easy. Monday night away from home, London derby. We've been poor on the road. Uh, that that's the truth and then a game against Manchester City to follow that um, of course after a Europa League tie but the the fixtures are not letting up they're not getting any easier it's a real real worry we're going into a really dangerous period and a period in which we could find ourselves hovering just above the relegation zone by the time we come to the end of it so real concern um, I think the time is to act now and Arsenal need to go out there do whatever it takes and get that top top manager in a uh, big thank you to every single one of you for tuning in don't forget to hit like or subscribe if you're watching us via YouTube if you're listening via the audio please please do leave us a review and we'll be back very soon with more uh, if you haven't already check out a post-match reaction video uh, from outside the Emirates posted uh, immediately after the game finished um, check that out let me know what you think about that as well and uh, until next time take care